Biosphere 2 was one of the greatest scientific efforts and failures in science of all time. Like something out of the best science fiction movies, it started with a group of well-meaning scientists and ended in close calls, failures, and arrests. It all started in 1969 at Synergia Ranch Eco Village, founded by John Polk Allen in Santa Fe County, New Mexico. It was created as a self-sustaining ranch where people were strongly encouraged to be creative. John Allen and those who joined him were specifically interested in producing biotechnic products. To support themselves, they provided meeting spaces for groups, made and sold furniture, and provided wool from llamas. John Allen and the people of Synergia Village believed that the earth had been worn out and shattered by the careless people living in it, and it was their responsibility to restore it and find a new, sustainable way of living. John said, Western civilization isn't simply dying, it's dead. We are probing into its ruins to take whatever is useful for the building of a new civilization and replace it. It was a noble thought, but as his vision grew, what seemed like triumph and a new dawn for the planet was in fact doomed to dark days. As Synergia grew, its unique vision began attracting people from all walks of life who wanted to get away and be part of this unique community. Throughout the 1970s, one man in particular who would prove to be key to the future of Biosphere 2 began to build a friendship with John Allen. His name is Ed Bass. In 19 in 1959, Edward Bass, along with his three brothers, inherited $2.5 million from their uncle, Sid Richardson, who was a wealthy oil tycoon. Ed and his brothers then took that money, and together they successfully made bets on oil and pipelines, and turned that $2.8 million into billions over the years. In 2012, Ed Bass was ranked as number 239 on the Forbes 400 list of wealthiest Americans. Ed has been very generous with his wealth, having given tens of millions of dollars to several educational institutions. His family alone has given over $200 million just to Yale University. Throughout the 1970s, Ed Bass began visiting Synergia Village, and as they talked, John Allen shared with Mr. Bass about his vision for self-sustainable biospheres that could be used when either the Earth could inevitably no longer sustain life by the lack of care of its inhabitants, or a fallout from a nuclear war rendered the planet unlivable. An eco-village was great, but susceptible to the changes in the weather, which wasn't stable and most likely temporary. John Allen wanted to build a permanent structure where they could take the philosophies and what they had learned from Synergia Village and integrate them into something truly revolutionary. Up until that point, biospheres or biomes had never been bigger than the size of a baseball and were used to study things like algae and shrimp. Ed Bass came on board, and in 1984, they created the Biosphere 2 project. They called it Biosphere 2 because planet Earth itself is Biosphere 1. They truly intended on creating something that could fully replace Earth on a smaller scale, with the hopes that if the first Biosphere was successful, they could duplicate it in other parts of the world. They even had plans to launch a Biosphere into orbit in 1995, and then onward to the Moon, and finally, Mars. Ed Bass provided $150 million in funding for the new project, and they moved it to a 40-acre piece of property in Oracle, Arizona. Construction on the mammoth 3.14-acre structure began in 1987 and didn't finish until 1991. They brought in the top experts to consult on the construction of the biosphere. They had people from the U.S. Geological Survey, the Smithsonian Institute, and even Britain's Royal Botanical Gardens. Because this structure was meant to be able to withstand any type of environment, even space, it had to be perfectly airtight, if at all possible. And if you are living surrounded by the fallout of a nuclear bomb, the one thing you don't want is cracks in your biosphere. Doing this in such a large structure was in itself a feat worth bragging about. Another challenge to this was the fact that the volume of air changes with temperature. So during the day when the Arizona sun was hot, the air expanded, and at night it would contract. This created an issue of pressure within the structure and threatened its ability to maintain the lack of air leakage over long periods of time. To deal with this, the engineers built two giant lungs. As the air expanded during the day, it would rush through underground tunnels and fill these lungs, expanding and pushing against massive rubber diaphragms. Then, as the air cooled, 
the diaphragms would push back down, forcing the air through the tunnels again. It was a brilliant solution. They managed to seal the entire biosphere to a point where it had a leak rate of only one-fourth of a percent per month, which was about as perfect as they could get it with the technology available. Once construction was completed in 1991, a group of brave souls began preparing to live for as long as they could inside of Biosphere 2 and save the world in doing so. I can only imagine they must have felt a little bit like Noah when God started bringing the animals to the ark. Because in order to create a truly self-sustaining community, they would need creatures that were capable of doing everything from pollinating flowers to decomposing waste. They brought in over 3,800 species of plants and animals for this. When they finally felt ready, the Biosphere 2 project hosted a 2,000 person dance party the night before launch on September 26, 1991. And this was no small dance party either. Massive stars came for the event. People like John Ratzenberger, Timothy Leary, and even Woody Harrelson were all there. They also had fire jugglers, people running around on stilts. It was a night to remember. There were eight people who would inhabit the biosphere too, and they were the following. We weren't able to find photos for everyone, but here are their names and the photos we could find. Medical doctor and researcher Roy Walford, who, according to Newsweek, was the only scientist in the group of any reputation. Jane Pointner, Taber McCollum, Mark Nelson, Sally Silverstone, Abigail Alling, Mark Van Thillo, and Linda Lay. The plan was that while they were inside the biosphere, they would truly be locked in with no contact from the outside world. One of the biggest concerns was the psychological toll it would take on eight people being locked into one place together for so long. But they were determined to have a true test and no psych evaluations were planned. The doors locked and the great project began. There were problems almost immediately, however. Within just two weeks, Jane Pointner sliced off the tip of one of her fingers, and it was so bad that Dr. Walford was unable to fix it, and she had to be taken out of the biosphere for surgery. Along with that, they also broke their commitment to reject outside help even further by bringing in a bag of supplies from Biosphere 2's management with computer parts and color film. The next issue arose from the food. They were able to produce bananas, beans, wheat, papaya, and other fruits and vegetables, but it simply wasn't enough to sustain them and they lived in constant hunger. Dr. Walford put them on a tight, calorie-restricted diet to conserve the food, but the hunger started to take a psychological toll on them all. Even though the building was massive by human standards, it was tiny for animals that were used to living outside in the wild, and the rapid, unnatural chemical changes that took place within Biosphere 2 was just too much for them. All the hummingbirds, bees, and other pollinating animals died out, and there was a massive rise in cockroaches and a major infestation of ants. It wasn't long before they started needing outside help. The outside leaders began bringing in more and more supplies to Biosphere 2. They brought seeds, mouse traps, vitamins, and more twice a month. The carbon dioxide levels became a problem and the Biosphere 2 couldn't handle it, which was dangerous for the eight people living there, so an engineer came in and secretly installed a carbon dioxide scrubber to balance it out. After a few months, the eight people were starving. Their crops were either dying or not producing enough, so they had to pull out a secret supply of three months worth of food that had been stashed there before the doors ever even closed. Talk about confidence in the project. Another nail in the coffin was when Biosphere 2 began leaking oxygen. The lungs and seals began to fail, and while air leaked out, not enough was coming back in. This created an environment where a certain bacteria began to breed that consumes large amounts of oxygen. This meant that the eight Biospherians didn't have enough oxygen themselves to live on, and suddenly they felt like they were living at an extremely high altitude. You would think that the experiment would have been shut down, but the Biosphere 2 founders had turned the entire area into a theme park of sorts, and that was generating lots of money. While the project was ongoing, Newsweek wrote an article saying that to that date, there had been nearly a million tourists who had come through. There was a gift shop with bumper stickers, shirts, and even tours for $9.95. The promise was that as the project continued supposedly succeeding, people would eventually be able to look inside and watch the Biospherians work. After spending $150 million on the project, people like Ed Bass wanted a return on their investment. Shutting down after only a few months would have been an unacceptable loss. So they kept the project going, even 
as it was falling apart inside. To counteract this lack of oxygen, they sent in a truck filled with liquid oxygen and sprayed it into Biosphere 2, which very likely saved the lives of the eight people living inside. The New York Times reported that when the oxygen was sprayed inside, the eight people were so revitalized that they raced through the biosphere in joy. The problems continued to get worse both inside and outside the biosphere. Ten months in, the board of directors had a major falling out and pretty much all quit. And on top of this, inside, the crew of eight started splintering into two factions that hated each other. However, for those eight, they had been so personally invested in the project that even though they got to the point where they weren't even on speaking terms anymore, they refused to leave. Because what else would they do if they weren't part of this project? The two factions were divided into those who wanted to remain pure biospherians and move forward being totally self-sustainable, while the other group began to care less about actually living as if they were on the moon or something, and focus more on simply doing the research to do this more successfully in the future. This meant that they were even leaning toward the possibility of openly bringing in food and supplies so that they could be mentally and physically at their peak to do their research, unhindered by the hunger and psychological stress they were under. Ed Bass saw what a catastrophic failure Biosphere 2 was, and he asked for the help of Steve Bannon. Bannon was an investment banker whose main specialty was the total overhaul of failing companies. When Bannon accepted the position and came in, he saw that Biosphere 2 was going to have a loss of up to $20 million in 1993 alone, not counting the previous years. The tourism just wasn't making up the loss. So Banning fired John Polk Allen and all of the original leadership. And finally, after two full years, the first mission concluded on September 26th, 1993. The original crew of eight members came out of Biosphere 2 to find everything in the organization was totally different and that they would be replaced by a completely new crew. This this was a shock to them, and while the new crew was establishing themselves into the Biosphere 2 to restart the program, Abigail Alling and Mark Van Thillo two of the original eight, broke back into the biosphere illegally to warn the new crew to be careful and show them how to properly run the place. Abigail Alling later told reporters that she was worried the new crew would die because they didn't know what they were doing. She said she was worried it would be a catastrophe similar to the explosion of the Challenger. Alling and Van Thillo were arrested, however, and this caused a whole wave of lawsuits. Finally, Mr. Bannon and the other financiers decided the Biosphere 2 was similar simply too much to deal with. It was an utter failure with no hope of being dug out of the hole that it was in. And after only five months, the second crew was pulled out. The entire project was given over to Columbia University to run. And they decided to no longer attempt creating biospheres, but to instead use the property to study coral and do smaller experiments. And then finally, in 2003, Bannon officially donated Biosphere 2 to the University of Arizona. He donated $20 million to help them keep it running, and all the original founders officially washed their hands of the project. Biosphere 2 now stands as a monument of scientific exploration and failure. Interestingly, Synergia Ranch is still up and running, John Polk Allen is still alive, and has quite a legacy to leave.